many strange things about being a New Zealander in America. Uh, let me tell you one of them. I was in the hardware store a couple of weeks ago. And I said to the woman helping me, do you understand what I mean? And she said, no, but keep talking. I love your accent. <laughs> if you find in the next 15 minutes that's happening to you, request my science kit. I write in American. <laughs> it must be immensely frustrating to be a physician. You know that your patient just needs to eat a bit less, drink a bit less, and exercise a bit more, and they will live a longer and healthier life. But it's very hard to persuade patients to do what's good for them in the long run. And of course, this is part of the human condition. It's the reason your stock portfolio isn't doing so well. The managers are only concerned about the quarterly statement. It's the reason Congress isn't doing so well. The politicians just care about the next election. It's one of those things that is really, really weird. It's like everybody thinks the future is somebody else's business. Well, I'm in that business. I think about the future. I think about the future of infectious diseases, and I'm a little bit worried, and I'm here to tell you why. Let me tell you how I got worried. I got into science in order to study and save New Zealand's endemic birds. There are many weird and great, wonderful birds in New Zealand. This is one of them. It's the kākāpō. It's a parrot. It walks. It's given up flying. It walks everywhere. And it breeds every four years. And that picture of me looking very young and idealistic was taken 30 years ago, and I'm holding a bird whose name was Sass. Sass died two years ago from old age. And he may well have been 50 or 60 when I was holding him. These birds live longer than us. So I start wondering to myself, how is it, what could make, what would create a bird that's given up flying and walks everywhere, breeds every four years and lives longer than us? Weird, huh? And then I discovered it was possible to make a living by asking that sort of question. <laughs> Fantastic, I'll have a piece of that, I thought. So I became a professional evolutionary biologist. And I learned during my training that if you actually want to see, feel, get your hands dirty with evolution, really see it, really smell it, get up close to it, you need to be working with small things that breed like crazy. These guys do it too slowly. And so now I work with malaria parasites, and malaria parasites do evolution on steroids. The only way we can stop them evolving in my lab is by plunging them into liquid nitrogen, freezing them solid. That's really exciting professionally. It's just fantastic, because we can have so much fun with the evolution. But as a human being, you start to get a little bit scared about the forces that you're trying to contain in the laboratory, because those forces make an enormous number of people very sick. Many of you are here today because your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents did not die of infectious diseases. Drugs, vaccines, and hygiene are amongst the greatest triumphs of medicine. They were so good that in the 1960s, the US Surgeon General was saying the war on infectious disease was won. Let me say that again. In the 1960s, the medical establishment thought there would be no infectious disease medicine in America. Well, they are sure not saying that today. Up to 100,000 Americans will die this year of infections that were easily treated when that well, photo of me was taken 30 years ago. 100,000 Americans. That's because the drugs, these wonder drugs, aren't working so well now. The bugs have evolved resistance. 100,000 Americans is twice the number, more than twice the number, that will die in car crashes this year. Now, you all know somebody who's died in a car crash. Cars have been around longer than these resistant bugs. So if you don't already know somebody who's died of an infection, you will soon. All of this is actually unsurprising, we attack our germs with chemicals. It's chemical warfare. We carpet bomb our bodies with these drugs. Just imagine you are all the germs in my body. And I've got a wonder drug that takes out type A personalities. <laughs> is there anybody here who's a type B personality? <laughs> Let's imagine over here I've got two type B personalities. And we carpet bomb the place with this drug that kills off the type A's. Those two type B's 
then have the world to themselves and their offspring and their grand offspring and their great grand offspring can fill my body again, make me sick again, and I can spread them on to others. Now that is natural selection. Natural selection is one of the most powerful life forces in the universe. I think of it as like capitalism and market forces. It's unstoppable, it's ruthlessly efficient, and it can be very, very fast. So drugs can actually fail in the face of this natural selection faster than we can get new drugs through regulatory hurdles. What's driving this natural selection? Well, it's medicine. Medicine, the use of medicine, is responsible for this natural selection. There exist in New York hospitals today bugs, Klebsiella bugs, that are called pan-resistant Klebsiella. Pan-resistant Klebsiella cannot be killed by any known drugs that would not also kill the patient. That is a creation of modern medicine. Klebsiella, 30 years ago, was easy to treat. Pan-resistant Klebsiella has been created by medicine. You might get an infection in a hospital in a year's time. How easy that infection is to treat depends entirely, or very largely, on decisions being made right now by patients and doctors who are treating the ancestors of those bugs. So you really want that the decisions they are making in those hospitals today are going to be good decisions, right? This is actually the point where doctors check out of conversations with me. <laughs> I talked to one of my infectious disease colleagues recently, a physician, and his reaction was, look, Andrew, we pay ill-informed lip service to resistance management, doing something about the problem, and then we get on with treating our patient. This is the physician equivalent of the patient who refuses to take diet advice. Patients can't close their eyes to the future, and nor can we, the medical professionals. So what are we going to do? Well, humanity has got two plans for how to deal with this problem. Plan A is drug discovery. We are going to discover new drugs to replace the drugs that are failing. And when our new drugs fail, we'll get some more drugs. And we'll discover some more and we'll keep going. So plan A is an arms race. Plan A is a plan that we will indefinitely engage in an arms race between the bugs and the drugs. It'll be a drugs-bugs arms race that will go on for as long as there are bugs. In other words, forever. Now, arms races can be won. They're usually won by the side that can afford to keep going and spend more money the longest. I think we'll have our Sputnik moments, but we're going to be the Soviets here. If you think about this, every ne next generation drug, the one that goes on the replacement, they're already more expensive than the last. Industry is already getting out of this business. There's no profits to be made in antimicrobial drugs. The bugs themselves are leapfrogging ahead. They've become resistant to some drugs we haven't even invented yet. And then there's a really interesting open question. Is there actually an indefinite supply of drugs to be discovered? Seems to me that arms races are something one wants to engage in carefully. There are times where vast nuclear arsenals are useful, but they're quite rare. And often a better way of containing the enemy is to be using smart deployment of the right weapon systems in the right place at the right time. And that, of course, is Plan B. Plan B goes by a variety of names. I like stewardship. This is the idea that drugs are special commodities in need of precious care for the, whole, for the good of the whole of humanity. That's kind of like the kakapo. Look after these things. Stewardship is actually about engaging in the game of evolutionary management, trying to change the bugs of the future. And you already know about some of this. For example, antibiotics are restricted you can't buy them over the counter, you need to get them on prescription. And that is an attempt to uh, restrict the use of these antibiotics in the community, minimizing the amount of natural selection that we provoke. That sort of thing is actually humanity's largest attempts to change the evolution of any organisms on the planet, at least deliberately. And I'm right up for that sort of plan. Plan B, using these drugs sensibly, has to be the way to go. But I see two challenges. The first challenge is the one I've already mentioned. Can doctors and patients be persuaded to think about the rest of us and the future when they're in the clinic? And then the second one is the one I think of as the hard science problem. Imagine we can actually persuade the patient and the doctor to think about the rest of us and the future. 
Imagine that they come to us and say, well, we care about the future and you, what should we do? And there I think we've, we, we scientists and I, my community, we've done a lousy, lousy job on the science behind Plan B. I think we are in the intellectual dark ages when it comes to the science of evolutionary management. Now, sure we've done some easy stuff, when we restrict the antibiotics, less antibiotics, less evolution. Uh, we believe in hygiene, no bugs, no evolution. You know, politically those are hard things, but actually intellectually they're no-brainers. It's the more interesting, difficult stuff that we've been shying away from. Let me give you um, a plan, let me give you a, um, a problem which I think is so fundamental but we don't actually have a good understanding of it at all. You all know when you take your antibiotics that you have to finish the course, to run out the pill box or the tear pack. The thinking there is that we want to get rid of every bug so they can't become resistant. Okay? And that's, you know, go back to my analogy, you're all my bugs in my body, and I use my wonder drug. That stops all you type A personalities becoming type Bs. But what if there are some Bs down here already? And I keep pounding away with my drugs long after I feel better, getting rid of all of the competition, leaving the world entirely to the Bs. So that's two evolutionary forces that are set in train when you follow the instructions to finish your antibiotic course. None of the A's can turn into B's, that's good, but any B's that are there can be released and have the world to themselves, and that's bad. So those are two opposing forces, two opposing evolutionary forces. And I believe when you are following the instructions to finish your course, that you are following in an orthodoxy that was first proposed by Alexander Fleming, he certainly mentioned it in his 1945 Nobel Prize speech, for penicillin. It isn't at all clear to me that from an armchair or indeed from a Nobel Prize podium, it's possible to work out how those two opposing forces will play out in different circumstances and different situations. That's an open research question in my head, and that's what a lot of my research group is working on at the moment. I don't have any good answers on that one yet. All I can say in our hands for the disease we're working on in mice, the current thinking is not the best way to go. There are a lot of, well, I should say first off a disclaimer on that. I don't want you to change or disbelieve your doctor's advice. Not yet, we're working on the problem. <laughs> she might at the moment be right and I might be wrong. My point is that we don't know. And I think there's a ton of questions like that that we need if we're gonna do plan B properly. If we're gonna do the stewardship and evolutionary management. There's a ton of questions like that. I think the approach here has to be that we have to start thinking about this whole process of natural selection for what it really is. When we carpet bomb our bodies with these drugs, we radically change the world that these pathogens exist in, and they're gonna evolve back. And that process is adaptation. Adaptation was discovered by Darwin and Wallace in the mid-1800s. And since then, there's been fantastic studies done on adaptation on a huge variety of organisms. My favorites are Darwin's finches and slime mold. We understand with exquisite, um, they have an exquisite view of the evolutionary forces that change the bill shapes of those Darwin's finches or create the um, fruiting body on the slime mold. And I think we need to have that sort of exquisite understanding of the adaptation of our bugs when we hit them with our drugs. We really, really, really need to understand the evolutionary forces unleashed by medicine. I think if we're really serious, we've got to start measuring things. Measuring things like the, the selective forces acting, or different combinations of forces acting when we hit these bugs with drugs. And we've got to start measuring the evolutionary outcomes of different medical practices, actually measuring the evolution itself asking which best slows things down. I think we're really good at asking questions like, is a new technology safe and does it work? We need to ask now questions like, will it stay safe and will it keep working? And by safe here, I mean creating superbugs that do more harm and keep working, I mean avoiding the, the evolution that's gonna undermine those drugs. I think we need to get very serious about evolution proofing. Right from the get-go, we need to start thinking, can we retard or even stop the evolution that undermines our fabulous technologies? Sometimes we ought to do that perfectly, that might be quite hard in many cases. Sometimes we can just slow it down. 
I'm quite excited about all this. I think there is a real science of future change to be had here, where we can really try to manipulate the future. And it feels to me a bit like I remember Francis Collins talking about in the 1980s, where he was having trouble getting the medical community to pay any attention to genomics. Feels to me a bit like that when I talk to the medical community about evolution. We're on the cusp of something exciting here, and things really could be, be good for the future. No magic bullets, but like genomics, a whole new way of thinking about things. I just want to leave you with a, a final thought. I sent a paper to The Lancet, which is one of the world's leading biomedical research journals, proposing an evolution-proof solution for malaria, a product that would work forever. And the paper got rejected not because it was wrong or boring or too ambitious. It got rejected, according to the editor, because a good understanding of evolutionary biology would be beyond most of our readers. <laughs> now, I have to say that I feel some sympathy with the Lancet readers here. A good understanding of evolutionary biology was only acquired by humanity about 100 years ago, and most of humanity still doesn't have a good understanding of it. And the Lancet readers have an awful lot of other things that they have to understand well. But I think we really have to fix this. I put it to you that evolution is going to be a great challenge for the 21st century. When we attack our germs with vaccines, when we attack our germs and our worms with drugs, when we attack our insects like mosquitoes with insecticides, when we attack our cancers with anti-cancer drugs, we are attacking life, and life evolves back. We are picking a fight with natural selection, and natural selection is one of the most powerful life forces on the universe. Going into a fight like that without Darwin is like going to the moon without Newton. Thanks very much.